Welcome to Faith Connect. Um, I think we've got some announcements about volunteer appreciation. Take it away, Drew. Hey, everybody. It is National Volunteer Appreciation Week. And here at the Mustard Seed, we do all of our volunteer appreciating on that week as well as many different organizations around the city and the country, obviously, are celebrating their volunteers. So if you see a volunteer wearing a yellow lanyard, Give them a big thank you. Be like, thanks for being here. Simple thanks is usually all they want. We try to give them gifts this week and many of them decline because our volunteers are like, hey man, I just want to help our guests. So, uh, But anyways, we do have a big event happening on Friday for our volunteers. Last year, somehow staff learned or thought that it was an open invite. It's not. It's actually closed invite event. We have, you know, we do about 1,400 volunteers a month with all of our different groups and spontaneous volunteering and everything. So if, if it was an open event, we would pack it out and we couldn't celebrate people accordingly. So if, if you guys hear about volunteers by email or a random inquiry or even people on site, tell them to just touch base with our team and we'll see if we can fit them in or give them more information if they haven't fit in. So um, yeah, keep that in mind. Last but not least for Calgary specifically, uh, we're sending out an email with a really fun quiz for the staff, a little staff um, engagement piece around volunteers. And so the top three winners of the email and the quiz will receive a really cool gift. So we encourage you to, you know, look for the answers, um, learn from our staff about what the right answer could be because it's kind of a skill testing quiz and the winners will receive a really cool gift. So, and that's for you guys and partly so that we can appreciate you, the staff who've done such a great job stewarding our volunteers. You know, we can get them through the door and it takes our whole team to really rally it behind them and make them effective, but also um, champion them. So we want to thank you guys for doing that this year. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Christensen uh, today. Um, he's the pastor of local and global engagement at Westview Baptist Church, and Westview has been a partner of the Mustard Seed for quite some time. Bill has been a pastor for many years, um, both in Calgary and out of Calgary, um, and he's passionate about justice and equipping churches to live integrated lives in their neighborhoods. Right now he's working on his doctorate in Christian community development, so I think he'll have some good words for us today. So please welcome Bill. Thanks, Dirk. Uh, yeah, it's a real privilege to be here. I'm, uh, I've been in Calgary for six years and uh, over that time in and out of here, connecting with a number of different people and, and getting to see uh, kind of the development, knowing some people who've been on staff that have been in churches that I've been involved in. And so getting to hear over and over again, you know, kind of the, the ministry and the work that goes on here, uh, seeing this building go up in the midst in, in that time has been, uh, you know, something that we, uh, me as a pastor in the city, just gets to celebrate looking at saying, okay, this is, this is, this is what it means to um, have a heart for, um, for people, having a heart for uh, the city and having a heart for, for going into the city with God's good news and seeing that produce goodness, that produce good results. And so, yeah, it's a real privilege for me to be here. As Derek said, I'm, uh, my, my title right now is, is pastor of uh, local and global engagement. And it's a, it's, I just started. Um, and as part of the, the contract, I said, well, can, I, I, if I'm coming in to, to make some changes, if I'm coming in kind of with some new ideas, uh, let me kind of rock the boat a little bit. And so, you know, generally I'm coming in as the 
uh, what would have been the outgoing um, portfolio of, of outreach and missions. And I said, well, I don't actually, don't, don't actually like those words. And so can I change the words? And said, well, instead of outreach being kind of just, you know, something we do to people, something we offer, can I, can I call it local engagement? And they said, yeah, call it local engagement. And, and by that, I mean, okay, I want to be in our neighborhoods, uh, in the city, in a way that is mutual, in a way that I'm engaging with people. I'm coming to them and saying, I want to be in a relationship with you. And I want you to be in relationship with me. And I want us to do that together. So local engagement is this sense of being in our neighborhoods and just saying, let's have a relationship. Let's see what we can do with this. Let's see where God's at work and let's do it together. And then global, uh, this idea of missions with the S, it's all the semantic things and I get caught up in it. But I wanted to, to have a perspective where we weren't just looking at the world and saying, okay, what can we pay for? Um, but rather, how can we engage in a way that allows us to have a personal investment? How can we engage in a way that we, we uh, have a relationship with people overseas and say, what can you teach us? What can you teach us about what it means? And so I am, as, as of now, the, the pastor of local and global engagement, this sense that we're moving from outreach and missions to engagement, to full kind of relationship. And so that's where I've come from. As I'm looking at what it means to be engaged um, and what it means to be on mission. One of the passages that, that comes to uh, mind for me from scripture is, is when G uh, John the Baptist is in prison. And uh, you know he's obviously been trumpeting and, and saying, you know, uh, the, the one is coming who, who, we've been, who we've been waiting for. He baptizes Jesus and says, you know, he announces this is the one. But he's in jail now and he sends his, his disciples in, in this kind of strange scene and says, you know, go find out if he's the, he, if he's the one. And Jesus says to his disciples, says, go back to John and report to him what you've seen and heard. Blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. To Jesus, that's what it means for his kingdom to come. That's what he's about. That is what it, it looks like um, in his mind that ministry is happening. You know, we've, we've in so many ways reduced that to uh, go tell people that they, uh, Jesus died for their sins and that they need to follow him in order to go to heaven. Uh, not saying any of that is wrong, but it's just this narrow sense where Jesus says, no, if, if you see goodness happening, if you see lives restored, if you see justice reign, that's where you know that the kingdom of God is present. And so for me, the, this idea has just been shaping, uh, more and more shaping how I understand myself, how I understand myself as a pastor and how I understand myself as a neighbor and, and, a, and a participant in the city. And so I've been on this journey uh, towards this idea of uh, engagement. Uh, about 20 years ago now, I, I, um, we started at a church in Vancouver and uh, just as a family, just attending, and uh, a church that was deeply invested in its neighborhood. And so we moved into the neighborhood. And uh, through that process, I actually became uh, the neighborhood pastor of one of the congregations that we were, that we were working in. And so this whole sense developing me, in me that says, okay, if you want to be a pastor in, in this neighborhood, if you want to have an impact, then you need to be invested in the lives of the people around you. So at that time, two decades ago, uh, I, I, the sense developing in me that, uh, you know, okay, let's get to know our neighbors. And so that, that was a really good thing. I mean, it was a, uh, the sense that um, those people that lived right around me were essential to who I was. I wanted them to speak into me and I wanted them to know, you know, that the kingdom had come. But in the process of that, I met a woman uh, who had just started or, or was in the process of starting a, uh, uh, an initiative um, that was focused on the homeless population in Burnaby. And she said to me, she told me the story about uh, her own kind of conversion into this, where she was uh, sitting in her, in her townhouse uh, and with her young daughters and had discovered that a man had been living under her steps. And so as a, you know, as a, as a mother of young daughters, she, you know, she, she, this scared her. Up. And uh, so the response that, you know, we, would be typical for most people what she called the police and so the police came and uh and and had a conversation with her and said yeah i mean i i, I could arrest this man 
I mean, he's, he's on your property. He's, you know, we could go through that whole process. But he said to her, and it just impacted her. And when she told me it impacted me, she said, do you really want me to arrest this man for not having a home? Do you really want me to arrest him for being a victim of the system? And it really struck her and it moved her to engagement, moved her to say, okay, well, let's see what uh, we can organize in the city to try and um, move towards a better solution. And it impacted me. And so that was a, a transition for me uh, in my thinking about what it means to be a pastor, what it means to be involved in ministry. And so the process continued and um, it could transform kind of how I engaged um, with, with the relationships that I had in the neighborhood. So when we moved to Calgary, one of the priorities was to connect with those who were um, working to help life flourish in our neighborhoods. And when specifically when I moved into, into Bonass and started pastoring in Bonass, uh, just there's a plethora of, of agencies in Bonass. I mean, it, it's the, one of the neighborhoods in our city that's been said, okay, let's send everyone there. And they did. And so uh, there's this opportunity there, you know, whether it's working with uh, church agencies, whether it's working with secular agencies, whether it's working with the government, uh, the community association, this emphasis on saying, let's, let's focus together on what it means for us to help all of our neighbors to, to thrive, all of our neighbors to flourish. And that, that again, transformed me, it transformed my understanding of what it meant to be a pastor. I wasn't there to just create programs um, recruit people, and then do stuff to and for people. I was there to work with those who were doing good. When I looked around the neighborhood and I saw family, uh, saw families that were flourishing, when I looked around the neighborhood and saw people that were getting housed, um, you know, whether or not my stamp was on that or not, I looked around and I said, that's God. That's good. And so I want to be a part of that. And so in the midst of that, uh, again, this growing process, and do, I did a, a community economic development certificate through SFU. Again, this idea, this social uh, enterprise, this social uh, responsibility, where it said, you know, we work together for the flourishing of all people. And then as uh, Derek said now, at this point, I've, I've, I've decided in the last year, I or initiated in the last year to start my doctorate. Uh, in Christian community development, working with some people in, uh, in the U.S., Christian Community Development Association in the U.S., this big organization that for the past 40 years has been saying, you know, all right, we need to figure out how, how do we do this in a way that gives people dignity and in a way that transforms lives. And so I feel very blessed to be able to uh, interact with a number of people uh, across Canada and a lot of people in the U.S. who are saying, okay, we need to be... Uh, building the kingdom in a way that gives everybody life. And so that's where, I, uh, that's where I am. And when I come to, again, to the scriptures, again, to Jesus, um, I'm, I'm drawn into Luke chapter four. So Jesus is starting his ministry and he's, uh, they say he's 30 years old. So he's been kind of building this life and becoming, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's been faithful. And he, and he comes into the, uh, to the synagogue one Sabbath, as he does, has probably done every single uh, Sabbath for his life. He comes into the synagogue, and it's his turn to read. And so they hand him the, the scriptures, and, uh, and he declares, in turning to Isaiah, he declares his mission. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the mission of Jesus. This is the mission that he has given to us. Is there a clock in here? Just so I can make sure I have one here. <laughs> Pastor, tend to ramble. Uh, at our at the last year's uh, Christian Community Development Association, um, Lisa Rodriguez Watson, who's one of the, the, the administrators of the of the association, challenged Christians to live lives of what she called embodied protest of the realities of the world. The world needs the prophetic witness of Christians willing to proclaim in word and deed that God is present and active in the world. 
He is in the process of restoring all things to a state of shalom. He is inviting humanity, us, to participate with him in realizing justice. The focus of the, the conference and the focus of um, a lot of my reflections has been the ideas of justice and compassion. These are the invitations that, 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 that we've been given. The, the call is to say that we need to be living lives that are marked by justice and compassion. Justice is this idea of God's restored shalom, his uh, goodness being the, the reality in the world. And compassion is God's initiative towards those who are deprived of justice. When we align ourselves with God, we align ourselves with this prophetic presence of justice and compassion. This is the invitation of active engagement. This idea that we live in ways in which the reality of God is, is, is his presence and activity in the world. God, God is here, God is working, and God is inviting us to be part of what he's doing and how he's doing it. And he works within the confines or within the, the ideas of justice and compassion. So we need to be oriented towards justice. The shalom of an ordered well-being. To act justly is to live in accordance with justice. And justice as a practice is the focus on the systems that diminish the just state of the world. Isaiah, again, Jesus draws a lot from, from Isaiah. And in Isaiah 65, and I won't read the whole thing, or I won't read it, but to, to reference in Isaiah 65, Isaiah describes this world where there's peace, where people live side by side, where the lion and the lamb lie down together. This pictures and this ideas where, um, where shalom has been restored. So justice in this world is a, is a picture where the, the, the things, that, the realities that we look out in the world and we see are no longer uh, the reality. God envisions a society which would reflect his very nature and character. This is the kingdom of God and a society of justice. If we think about our world as compared to the, this world of justice, um, in contrast to what we see every day, uh, in contrast to the realities that we, we live uh, often, is that we anticipate a world where all people live long, healthy lives. Families are, have secure housing and access to food. Work will be plentiful and satisfying, and people will live with dignity, not fearing that they will be made a refugee or a slave. We pray, God, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It comes in, in, the, in the description, this idea of salvation. And again, we've reduced the idea of salvation to going to heaven. But for many of those who, who uh, experience marginalization, experience poverty, it's not merely escape from the world, that's salvation. Salvation is rescue from injustice. Salvation is not just knowing that God, the God who draws near, though it is that, but also experiencing justice in the society we live. And so we embody these in, uh, we embody justice in compassion. We put them together and we say that if we want to experience justice, then we need to move past the idea of, uh, of empathy. Empathy, again, all good things. But we want to say that compassion is empathy and responsibility. Compassion is empathy that's moved to action. And so we, when, as, we, as we understand and experience compassion, we move in, in a way that, uh, that, again, reflects who God is and what God is doing. It reflects God's preference for the poor. God extends himself and calls Christians to continue to extend ourselves towards those who are victims of injustice in the world. We see it in the Old Testament. I mean, in the Old Testament, they set up laws and said, uh, you, you need to take care of the poor and the widows and the foreigners, those who are excluded in our society. Those are the people we need to make laws, uh, make, make sure that we have laws so that we take care of them. In the New Testament, we constantly see G Jesus setting aside uh, other things so that he can be with those who the, who the world has pushed aside. He constantly says, these are the people that are my priority. In the early church, we have, we have church history where the early church was known for that. That was, that was their mark. They were known as the people who, um, who for, known for two things. They were known for not worshiping Caesar 
and they were known for caring for those who society had pushed aside. And so we carry on a, a huge and a long history of what it means to be those who are um, those who are overtaken by compassion. Compassion in, in, in the New Testament is this word that, that basically means gut-wrenching. It's moved to the point where you just, you're so moved that you cannot help but, but, but act. You cannot help but respond. And that's you know, a perfect uh, um, depiction of who God is and what God's like. Ruben Doss, who is now the I think executive director of the Canadian Bible Society, but has been with World Vision, has been with uh, a whole bunch of other um, uh, mission-oriented um, organizations, says that compassion is three things. Um, that God's compassion is that God seeks to bless human beings and his creation. Compassion is that he defends and protects those who are victims of evil. And compassion is that God desires his kingdom, to, his, his creation to be restored to him. He says to be compassionate in the midst of a culture which robs people of life is what it means to be the people of God in the world we live. Such a life reflects the very nature and character of the God we worship. Compassion is this, this idea where we are so moved. We, are, we, are, we have this gut-wrenching experience that we can't do anything but act. We can't do anything but move towards those for whom God has a heart and calls us to have a heart. So how do we live this, this justice and this compassion out? I think there's two ways that, uh, that um, uh, as, as, as workers in, 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 in this context, as pastor in my context, two, two ways that, that occur to me that we need to be living this out. And the first I would say is, presence. The invitation and the call and, the, and the, the, the challenge for you and for me is to be where you are. The incarnation is our model for this. And it's, it's Jesus, you know, the, John chapter 1 says Jesus came to be with us. Jesus came to be deeply with us. That he is um, he's come to, uh, to, to know the world. He's come to know the, the, those in the world and to be known. He, he's come that God might be known through him. And the only way that he, he, the way he chooses to do that and the way he calls us to do that is to be with people. And so the invitation uh, uh, and the challenge is, is to, to live into that. To, in, in our daily lives, you know, to make sure that we're present to those who are, who, who, who are with. To make sure that uh, they know that uh, um, in, uh, in in that moment they are the, they are what's important. And the, the, one of the um, attributes that are noted most of Mother Teresa is that when you know this woman who was you know I can't imagine how busy she was I and mean, this that and everything going on and you know the you know running uh, the um, a mission in Calcutta and uh, and. Um, one of the things that they noted, people noted her was that when you were with her, you were the only person in the world. She just, you, you knew that she was present to you. And that's a challenge for us. In our world um, of busyness and of priorities and of selfishness and all sorts of things, individualism, presence is a prophetic witness to the world. It's a prophetic act. It says, this is how God acts in the world. This is who God is in the world and our presence is announced and embodied um, when we uh, when we act towards those in that way injustice is so entrenched in our uh, society that it requires a miracle it really does it requires a miracle to move from injustice to justice and presence is one of those miracles presence is the way that god says i'm here and i'm working in you and through you and so God's presence in and through his people uh, is, the way that, is the way that he works. Um, Jonathan Brooks, who's a pastor in, in South Chicago, um, in his book called Church Forsaken, which is about you know, the church kind of running away from injustice towards the comfort of the suburbs, um, says in his context in, in, uh, in the Inglewood neighborhood in South Chicago, um, that presence is essential. That in order for him to minister to his neighbors, in order for him to minister to those on the, on the margins of society, they have to know that he's there. 
They have to know that he's present and they have to know that he has given himself over to the ministry of God in that place. And that is a miracle. We stand in the gap for the sake of others. It's countercultural. And we move from um, this outreach perspective to engagement when we move from just doing stuff to people and for people to doing stuff with people and eventually inviting them to do it for themselves. But the ultimate miracle is to move people to a place where their lives are flourishing once again. And so we live with presence. And the second way that we embody justice and compassion is through responsibility. I need to take responsibility for what I'm doing. It's not merely a job. Thankfully, it's a job. But the roles that we have in, in working in with justice and compassion is to say, this matters. I'm taking responsibility. Again, the move from empathy to compassion is when we take responsibility. I don't just feel bad about it. I actually do something about it. The effective Christian is able to take personal responsibility and move towards responsible action. One of the ways of describing this is, is as a, a non-anxious presence. Emphasizing the strength rather than witness, weakness, accountability rather than blame, and taking responsibility rather than, um, rather than just feeling bad for others. Justice and compassion, rather than empathy and anxiety, uh, enable us as leaders and as servants to engage the world and participate in transformation. Responsibility means that leaders take action to change the world, not merely circumstances. This is the big thing that, that, that one of the things that's really struck me as of late is this idea of justice, the full uh, perspective of justice, moving towards it. I mean, it's 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 a miracle at some point. It's 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 the it's the fulfillment of God's kingdom. But I need to live in that direction, in the direction of justice. We need to meet people's needs. That's that's a given. And I say this this with trepidation because I I have such great respect for. Um, the, the work that, uh, that many of you, that all of you do in, in, in ensuring that people's needs are met. But we are, the call for us is to move beyond meeting people's needs and towards justice. The ultimate goal is not to treat injustices, but to eliminate them. We move from charity into justice. This life of saying that ch you know, charity is the, the responsibility of addressing circumstances of injustice, where justice is addressing the systems of injustice. And so many of you, I, I have so much respect and, and, uh, and honor the work that you do in saying the systems of this city and of this province, this country, this world uh, are not good enough. People ought not to live like this. And so we, we, we come alongside them, we give them presence and our compassion moves us to, uh, to walk with them but ultimately to say, let's make a difference so that this isn't the case anymore. One of the challenges I had with my friends in, in working in, in Bonas with this number of, uh, there were probably sometimes 40 of us who got together and, and I would look around the room and, and, and honestly say to them, and to myself for that matter, I would honestly say to them, I hope that in the very near future, none of you have a job because that means that we've addressed the systems. That means that we've created life for people. But in the meantime, between now and eternity, there's work for us to do, to say, oh, I come alongside you and I work for a world where you no longer are oppressed. So compassion and justice are worked out through presence and taking responsibility. We break the cycle of perpetual injustice because justice is not merely unfortunate, or, or sorry, in, injustice is not merely unfortunate. It's evil. It's not the way the world is meant to be. And so we live holistically towards um, towards justice. We embody the gospel of Jesus, which offers transformation 
physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. God, God is calling and equipping us to demonstrate his kingdom of justice to the world and to extend that kingdom through lives of compassion and engagement. Rene Padilla, who uh, says of, of, of Mission Integral, kind of this liberation theology, says, uh, its purpose is to incarnate the values of the kingdom of God and to witness to the love and justice revealed in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit for the transformation of human life in all its dimensions, both on an individual and a community level. Once again, I commend you for your commitment to justice. And I pray for I pray for you, and uh, and and and, uh, and ask that God would bless you in the midst of ministry and bless those who you are blessed to minister to. Let me pray. God, we invite you to break our hearts continually, daily, to give us that gut-wrenching experience of compassion, which moves us towards justice. And so, Lord, as this day, even this day, as we're present with those around us, um, may your presence in our lives be evident, overflow into the lives of those around us, so that we might take responsibility for the mission you've given us and the call in our lives. I ask God for your blessing on these here and pray that um, your presence in their lives would, 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 uh, would develop in them the richness of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Bill. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. We'll see you again next week.